Hey guys, welcome or welcome back. Tisha here and we are back for another chapter read of Becoming Free Indeed. This is chapter four, Life Under the Umbrella. <clears throat> Once upon a time, a 21-year-old Christian woman met the man of her dreams. He was kind, smart, hardworking and handsome. Most importantly, he was a committed Christian. He loved God and wanted to obey him. The couple started spending time together and soon became convinced that the Lord was directing them to marriage. She was overjoyed. Ever since she became a Christian, she had wanted to be a wife and a mother. She took her boyfriend to visit her parents who were not Christians. Oh, for a second, I thought this story was about her. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm back. Um, and the daughter and her boyfriend told them their intentions to marry. After the young man left, the parents told their daughter, we don't think you should marry him. The daughter asked why they felt this way. They said, we can't give you a good reason. We just don't think you ought to marry him. Bill Gother presented that fictional scenario at one of his seminars. Yeah, that's right. After hooking his audience with this compelling story, he asked them a question. What should the daughter do? Should she and the young man marry or should they submit to her parents' wishes, even though the mom and dad are not Christians and have no good reason for disliking the young man? Gother said the latter decision is the right one. He told his audience the parent's authority is absolute. No matter the circumstance and no matter how misguided their decisions, parents must always be obeyed. That is so wrong. That is so... So if I'm no longer a child and I'm in my own household, which I'm currently in, and I'm paying for all my bills, my mom and dad can decide what I should do no. Should they have some type of input? Maybe. But to be the ultimate yes or no, even if they're wrong, I don't agree with that. My mother-in-law, Diana, faced nearly that exact scenario almost 40 years ago. Jeremy's mother was not raised in a Christian home. Not long after she became a follower of Christ, she met a young pastor named Chuck Volo. She liked him and wanted to date him, but her parents had concerns. They were proud of their daughter. She was an accomplished professional violinist. She had traveled internationally playing in some of the finest orchestras. Her parents thought their daughter's newfound Christianity was a phase, and they were concerned that if she married this pastor, she would be stuck in a religion the rest of her life and would have to give up her promising career. Marrying a pastor is a whole different level of commitment. I'm not even going to add the whole aspect of her being new to Christianity, but just marrying a pastor and what that entails. Woo. If Diana had followed Bill Gothard's teaching at the time, she likely would have ended the relationship with Chuck because her parents didn't approve. If she had followed the principle of authority, then the life my in-laws built together, their years of ministry, and the three children they brought into this world would have never happened. Hmm. Fifteen years ago, if I met a girl in the same situation as Diana when she fell in love with Chuck, I probably would have urged her for her own protection not to disregard her parents. At the time, I was, I believed all disobedience to parents, no matter the circumstance, was dangerous. I'd fully embraced a concept Gothard called the umbrella of authority. The umbrella of authority. According to this concept, God gives every person authority figures who must always be obeyed. Just as an umbrella protects us against the rain, these authorities protect a person from spiritual harm, including suffering, pain, and temptations from Satan. But Gother was Satan himself, so that's interesting. But also, like an umbrella, the protection is limited. During a downpour, one wrong step or strong gust of wind could leave an individual soaked. 
Likewise, according to Godfrey's teaching, one act of disobedience, even an unintended act of rebellion against authority could result in God's punishment. That kind of goes back to what Jill was talking about in her book, as far as some of her fears in regards to her parents and leaving the umbrella of protection. Gather taught that by rebelling, we were subjecting ourselves to the realm and the power of Satan. My teenage self would see other young people suffering or struggling spiritually and assume their pain was a result of some rebellion against their parents. If something difficult happened to me, I think I stepped out from the umbrella of protection because I unknowingly disobeyed or disrespected my parents. My understanding was the result of Gothard's teaching that the main role of authority figures is protection, not control. The essence of submission is not getting under the the domination of authority, but rather getting under the protection of authority. Of course, Gother taught that God was life's ultimate authority, but to live under the umbrella and enjoy a flourishing life, you had to obey, respect, and honor the four human institutions to which God had delegated his authority. Parents, government, church leaders, and employers. Interesting. Gother said Christians who disobeyed even one of these authorities would no longer be under the umbrella of protection and would instead find themselves under the domain of satanic attack. So if you don't do exactly what Gother said, Satan's going to attack you. In some ways, it was easy to live under the umbrella. Doing so turned my Christian life into a simple checklist. Did I break a law of the state of Arkansas today? If the answer was no, I was still under the umbrella. Did I listen to my spiritual authorities and commit to obeying what they said? Yes, up, oh, still protected. Finally, and most dominant in my life was the daily question. Have I done everything my parents asked me to do? Have I obeyed them with a cheerful, happy heart? This simple black and white view of authority relieves some of my insecurity and indecisions. I'm going to tell y'all like this. If I had to live under these teachings, I would have been in trouble all the time because there is a lot of times where sometimes I may have not agreed with something that my parents said, or maybe I was being secretive or something like that. And according to this teaching, that's wrong. For example, when I couldn't decide whether I should play broom ball or stay home and read my Bible, my dad took away a lot of my confusion when he told me I should go play broom ball. As silly as it sounds, broom ball became a matter of obedience to a God-given authority in my life. Since my dad wanted me to go, I was safe under the umbrella. In the same way, when I was struggling with my body image and nearly stopped eating, my mom lovingly told me I had to eat. This made maintaining a healthy lifestyle a matter of obedience. There are many similar examples when my parents' authority was used for good in my life. I know their leadership often protected me from harm. It's so interesting how she's only highlighting what she deems is good and she's not talking about the mistakes that they've made because I can easily flip some of that. But we'll keep going. Yes, though I did not realize it at the time, Gother's teaching was creating serious issues in how I understood God and reality. Problems with the umbrella of authority. As I look back on my teenage years, I wish I had spent more time studying what the Bible says about authority. It has so many good things to say about parents and pastors and all the authority figures God has placed in our lives. But if I had taken a more careful look at the Bible, I would have found that the umbrella of authority is not an idea presented within its pages. Gothard led me to believe that any little misunderstanding or misstep with my authorities will result in spiritual or even physical harm. Though I know authorities are there for my good and often for my protection, their authority is not absolute. Only God's is. I often got that backward when I was younger. Gothard's theology so emphasized obedience and submission to authority that I began to believe all authorities were parents or Gothard himself as our spiritual leader were never to be questioned or challenged in any way. They were simply to be obeyed. This had seriously negative effects. It's interesting because let's take the whole Christianity piece out of this. I feel like um, back in the day as a child, 
you weren't supposed to raise any type of questions to your parents. I remember many times where I was told that I was supposed to be seen and not heard or me trying to get clarification on something was me being told I was being disrespectful. So here you have this man saying, if you do anything along those lines, if you question these adults in any way, then you're wrong and you're you're coming outside of the umbrella. It's just it 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 it's it's a way that you push your narrative, you have what it is that you want out there and you falsify things because these people aren't fact checking by reading the same doctrine that he's supposedly getting this information from. It's dangerous. Sorry, I know that was a little all over the place, but my mind is all over the place. <laughs> Self-righteousness. Gather's teachings led me to believe that God was mainly pleased with me due to my obedience. I didn't outwardly rebel against my parents or any other authorities that were part of the umbrella. In return, I expected God to pour his blessings on me. One time, while my family and I were attending a conference led by Gother, we saw a billboard that criticized him and his teaching. I remember thinking it was so sad that someone could be that blind to the truth. They don't understand. They don't know what I know. They aren't as fortunate as I am, I told myself. The person responsible for that billboard had a heart of rebellion and was going to endure a lot of hardships in life. I wonder what made the light come on for her and realize that she needed to dig deeper, but we'll see. At other times, I heard about young people who grew up believing the same things I did, but then rebelled by listening to worldly music or wearing immodest clothes. And I expected God to punish them in a way he never would punish me. They were no longer listening to authority while I was fervent in my obedience. I was safe under the umbrella of protection. They had stepped out from under it and they were opening themselves up to Satan's attacks. Gothard emphasized obeying authority so much that I began to think obey was the most important commandment in the Bible. My Christian life became a transaction with God rather than a relationship with him. Hmm. If I obey the authorities in my life, then God will be pleased with me and bless me. If I disobey those authorities, God will not be happy with me and will not bless me. I have figured out this formula for receiving God's blessings. I felt sorry for anyone who didn't know about Gothard's principles because they didn't know anything about his teaching. They weren't going to experience the same joy and satisfaction that I would. That is extremely transactional. And then if you're really operating transactionally like that, is what you're doing really coming from, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, I cannot think right now. Is it coming from the right frame of mind? Like, are you doing it because you're really striving to be a better person? Or are you doing this because you feel like if I do this, then I'll get that? Throughout my teenage years, this self-righteous attitude was a big part of my identity. I was a fervent believer in Gothard's principles. And I thought I was pleasing God because I followed them zealously. I now see how that self-righteousness made me a lot like the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Israel during Jesus' life on earth. The Pharisees believed themselves to be righteous people who are committed to obedience. They sure did. But they were all about outward performance. Jesus said, they do all their deeds to be seen by others, Matthew 23, 5. They missed the whole point of knowing God. Like them, I was obsessed with outward performance and judge others who didn't follow the same rules as I did. Fear. As I talked about earlier, I was a fearful kid. I was terrified of seemingly everything, whether car crashes, sickness, and other people's perceptions of me. When I became a true Christian, those threats became much less threatening than God himself. The thought of displeasing or dishonoring God was, at times, an all-consuming terror. Gothard's teachings gave me a practical, specific path to please God, but his teachings, but what his teachings didn't do, and this is so critical, was give me the right view of God's authority. Even as these principles were giving me a system that I thought would please God, the ever-present umbrella of authority was teaching me to be afraid of God. Being afraid of God is different from fearing him. That's true. The Bible says that fearing God is a good thing, something that brings joy and peace. 
I now know that when the Bible talks about fearing God, it isn't talking about dread. It isn't telling Christians to think God is scary and terrifying. It isn't saying I should stay up at night with a knot in my stomach, afraid that God is going to punish me if I unknowingly break a rule. Instead, when the, di the Bible talks about fearing God, it's talking about being in awe of him. Author Jerry Bridges describes this well. Perhaps a good working definition of the fear of God is something like this. To truly fear God means to be in awe of God's being and character, as well as in awe of what he has done for us in Christ. When you put these two ideas together, you have an absolute sovereign creator of the universe who punishes those who resist him and yet loves us and sends his son to die in our place. Surely that's a good reason for fear or reverence to him. That's such a helpful truth. It teaches me that the appropriate fear of God isn't because he could hurt me or even kill me. The right fear of God is because he is all powerful in control of everything and at the same time, kind, compassionate, and loving. A being with that combination of qualities should be first feared for his character. Gotham didn't teach me to be in awe of who God is and what he's done, especially through Jesus Christ. Instead, he taught me to focus primarily on God's punishment. I learned to fear what God could do to me. While the Bible affirms that authority has a place in our lives, Gothard turned obedience into a matter of terror. If I misstepped in any way, I was removed from all protection and Satan would have full access. Was there no one that was working with him that had a mind of their own or did their own biblical research? Because how was this man able to convince so many people of his way of thinking without any type of pushback. As long as you are under God-given authority, nothing can happen to you that God does not design for your ultimate good, Gother said. This implied that if I stepped out from the umbrella, knowingly or unknowingly, anything that happened would not be for my ultimate good. That's why I was so passionate in my commitment to absolute obedience to my authorities. But the passion came from a wrong view of God, a terror of his authority and punishment, and therefore a wrong view of my earthly authorities. Gothner's teaching on this subject was tailor-made to produce that kind of fear. The danger of extreme authority. Bill Gothard may have coined the umbrella of authority concept, but he was certainly not the first person to promote or exercise this kind of authority, the kind that assumes a leader gets to give orders, the kind where it's the leader's job to tell the others what to do and people they are leading must obey with joyful hearts. This leadership structure is top down. Those in charge should be served by those being led. There are Extreme examples of this kind of authority, like Jim Jones, who led the People's Temple. Jones convinced more than 900 people that it was God's will for them to move to Guyana and Central America. Oh gosh, Jim Jones was a whole nother beast. A whole nother beast who did most of his things. It wasn't even sermons, but because he appealed to the masses and he didn't segregate like people and he was one of the first to have all these different races worshiping together and things of that nature he was able to gain a lot of attention anyways back to what she was saying back uh guyana central america where they attempted to set up a utopia an ideal society where they could live in harmony until christ's return of course that didn't work we are all imperfect so no society can be a utopia when some members of the congregation tried to leave jones stopped them then he convinced his people to drink kool-aid laced with cy cyanide um she's leaving a lot out he was hitting people he was uh sleeping with with uh the congregation some of the congregation he was holding his version of court and judging people he was having people show their body parts he was taking mothers from their children and fathers from their wives jim jones did a lot but i'll keep reading tragically 918 people died in what became known as the jonestown massacre Thankfully, most people are not told that to obey their leaders, they must take their own lives. But leaders still display this top-down view of authority in other ways. Perhaps a boss abuses his authority by demanding more work for less pay. 
This leader is frustrated when employees don't do things exactly as he says, or he keeps asking for things that make his life easier, but are not a part of someone else's job description. Maybe a church leader insists that he should have the final say so over where someone works, who to date and marry, what clothes to wear, and what music to enjoy. On top of that, he starts to imply that disobeying him is the same or dis is disobeying God. If you run into a church leader that's trying to do that or any leader that's trying to do that, uh, pull back. You don't need a dictator in your life, my opinion. God finally, and most personally, this shows up in a lot of families. Some parents don't just have opinions about their children's lives. They have commands. Even when their kids are all grown up, these parents expect to to be obeyed in all things. What a person, what's a person to do in those situations? How do we respond to those authorities in our lives? The biblical authority. I've spent more than a decade trying to disentangle a true understanding of authority from a false version Gothard taught. I had to learn what the Bible really says about authority and leadership. I'll always be amazed when I when I read the 13th chapter of John's gospel. In this passage, Jesus did not demand that his followers serve him. He did the opposite. He took a towel and a bowl of water and washed the disciples' feet. I will say that that is one of the most humbling things that I think I've done in church. Um, when I was in the Adventist church during communion, we washed each other's feet and it, it is humbling and it really allows you to kind of see what that would feel like to do it to somebody else. I haven't done that in years. Hmm. Anyways, at that time, everyone wore sandals and walked on dirt roads. When the head of the house came home, his servant would bend down and clean his feet. Therefore, the task was associated with servanthood and that's why Jesus did it. When he finished washing his disciples' feet, Jesus told them, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Verses 13 through 15. Incredible. Here was the greatest man who ever lived, the savior of the world, the king of kings and lord of lords. No one has ever had more authority than Jesus. But what did Jesus do with all his authority? He washed his disciples' feet. His disciples' feet. He served his followers. When Jesus and John, two of Jesus' most loyal followers, were, I'm sorry, James and John, two of Jesus' most loyal followers, asked Jesus if they could rule with him in heaven, Jesus told them that they had a wrong view of leadership. He said, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them but it shall not be so among you but whoever would be great among you must be your servant and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all for even the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many mark 10 42 through 45. bill gothard along with so many other religious businesses and political leaders taught the opposite of what Jesus said, that people in high positions should exercise authority over those they lead. I used to assume that was true. Now I understand that James and John should have asked Jesus how they could help others flourish, not what they needed to do to gain power. That same is true of leaders today. The leaders I want to follow and gladly obey are those who do not want to be served, but to serve. Leaders serve not only those they lead, but also God, the one who gave them their leadership. They are accountable to him. This is so important. A leader without accountability is not a true leader. God does not give his parents, presidents, pastors, or CEOs the free the freedom to lead however they want. God does not give parents, presidents, pastors, or CEOs the freedom to lead however they want. They are accountable to God and they are abusive leaders. They will face consequences. We see a good example of this in Ezekiel 34, where God chastened the leaders of Israel for not serving their people. I'm making up words. Where God chastised the leaders of Israel for not serving their people. 
What did God do about these dominating, abusive leaders? Ezekiel said God was going to rescue his people from them. He made it clear that God hates it when leaders abuse their authority. When that happens, God promises to free his people from their harm for leaders. God took away these leaders' positions and authority. He held them accountable. I've learned now that when I encounter a spiritual leader, I have to ask two questions. First, are they servant-minded? Do they understand their role? Second, are they accountable to God? Do they go beyond the word of God in their commands and expectations? Do they understand that there are limits to their leaderships? Um, That was more than two questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I didn't truly understand the nature of leadership when I was younger because I misunderstood what a leader is. I didn't examine any of Bill Gothard's teachings. I assumed he was spiritual authority, a prophet-like figure, and thought God wanted me to follow him. I'm very leery of people in this present uh, day and age who call themselves prophets. I'm one of those people who... I have to feel it um, to me, and some may disagree, that seeing sometimes is believing. And I feel like there are a lot of false prophets, so you have to be careful. Just saying. I don't know what would have happened to me if I stayed under the umbrella of authority and closely followed the rest of Gothard's principles throughout my life. I know it would have been exhausting to try to please God by obeying man-made rules. Perhaps at some point, the effort would have been too much. It was 4,000 of Gothard's followers who left Christianity entirely because the rules were too much of a burden. I might have joined them. I wonder if they did that at, before or after some of the things about him came out. Thankfully, when I was 21 years old, my life and my view of Gothard's teachings started to change. Okay, so she started thinking a little bit differently about things once she was 21. And that is the end of this chapter. I'm going to be honest. Um, I'm going to finish this book because I'm not one to start something and stop something. But Ginger has not captivated me yet. She's informing me of some things, but I feel like she's very wordy. Like she she talks a lot to get to what it is that she's trying to get to. And I'm one of those people who sometimes I don't like rambling. And sometimes it comes across to me as rambling. I can appreciate her view. I can appreciate her giving us a little bit more information and her kind of breaking down some of these concepts. But um, it's a bit much to me for some of these chapters, which is why in that chapter, I didn't really have a lot to add to it because to me, she was already saying enough. You all like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know, you know, what you thought of this chapter down below. Until next time.